Hello, everyone. How's it going? Welcome to another Paper One Fast Paper Live session. My name is Yavar. I'm the instructional designer for business at All Academy. And welcome back. I see a couple of familiar faces. Welcome, guys. Um, so, uh, as you know, um, <clears throat> I just got to do one more technical thing. Yeah, so uh, in this session, we are doing paper 2022, November 1, 3. And uh, as you know, all paper ones have two sections. Pa section A will have four questions and they will all amount up to 20 marks. Then there's section B where there will be the only choice that you will go, you're going to get throughout your business papers. Uh, so there's going to be two questions, five and six, and you are required to attempt only one of them. And there'll be a combination of eight and 12 mark questions. So when you attempt one, there will be another 20 marks. So in total, you're attempting 40 marks. And uh, the larger influence in this question is on knowledge and application, but 35% of the marks are awarded for knowledge, 30% 30 mar 30 of the marks are awarded for using right application. So, uh, but 65% is that. So don't be shy of defining things, going in detail about users, factors, and such things. And then... 10% uh, is evaluation, which is only required in the 12 mark question that you're required to answer right towards the end. Um, <clears throat> other things to remember, uh, section A is really where you guarantee your A grade. Really, that 20, those 20 marks, they're, they're so easy to score, uh, other than the five mark question where there's room for error. The other three are really easy to score, in my opinion. So your target should be nothing less than 17 from those 20. Uh, mostly it's definitions, uses, advantages, benefits, and such things. So you can really score well in those. And never skip to section B. Uh, always attempt section A first. So that easier 20 marks as compared to answering the 8 and 12 mark questions uh, in section B. So uh, go in sequence. Um, also, the way the uh, paper has been designed, the marks gradually increase, increase. So first you have a two mark question, then three, then five, then eight, and then 12. So uh, follow that sequence, um, keep it the right order. Um, and I think we should begin with the first question. And the first question, and, and by the way, the, first, the four questions in section A will be definitely from all different units. So there, there are five units, there are four questions. There's going to be four different units that take across the, uh, the four questions in section A. And we can see already the first one is an HR related question. And here they ask us to define the term person specification in part A. Now this is a two mark question. And whenever it's a two mark question, the recommendation is to include two different points about it. As different as they can be, do not sound repetitive. So that's something to remember. <clears throat> and if I'm answering part A here, first thing that I wanna say about person specification is, it's a written document. Prepared. By HR for recruitment. Right? It's a good idea to just tell where does its place lie, and its place lies in the recruitment and selection process. And what does it contain? It defines the skills, of experience, and uh, certifications or qualifications, whatever you want to call it, needed for the advertised job. Okay, so two very different things. I first explain why it's needed, then what it's contained within it. So as different as they can be two points, <clears throat> that's it, move on. And Often I've seen students make this mistake when I'm checking their papers and they read the first one person specification and the second one they read through very quickly and they read job description as person specification and they think though they've asked two purposes of person specification without carefully reading the question so <clears throat> don't do that pause for a minute look at the question properly they have asked us uh, about job description not person specification okay one more thing um 
So this year, we know that there's been a change in the syllabus, and they've also tweaked the way they uh, word the questions going forward in paper one. And uh, and as we already know, they've already sh just they've only shared one paper one sample paper specimen, and in that specimen, instead of asking for two reasons, the two purposes, they've now started asking for one. <clears throat> okay, so when you see part B of your questions. Just make sure you look closely if it's asking for one or two. So if it's just one, talk about one. If it's two, talk about two. Um, I'm going to mention two today in our discussion. So in case if two come up, you can talk about two of them. Okay, so let's go to part B. And the first person, first purpose for job description. Now, you do not need to define what job description is there. That's just wasting your time. They're looking for purposes. Job description is used to uh, explain the roles and responsibilities of the job. Right, and the good thing would be to maybe um, include as an example, what would they be? For example, timing, uh, salary, uh, position, et cetera, right? So <laughs> that is uh, one purpose that they explain the role and responsibilities. And the reason, then the benefit of doing this, the benefit of making a job description and explaining all of this is that uh, you have the, uh, how do I want to word this? The right employees, the right applicants. Right applicants will be attractive. Right? Then job description, uh, and just take a leap from one of the first point of what, a, what is job description? It tells you about, uh, for example, the salaries, it tells you about the roles and things like that. The second purpose could be that it is used to uh, eliminate unwanted applicants. Right, and this sort of becomes like a document for assessing workers. Uh, what's the word? Workers document for assessing. I want to say that they want to see if this worker is the right worker, work uh, worker for the job or not. Uh, document assessment workers. Uh, wait, it's going to come to me the word. Uh, ability to adapt. Ability to accept the job. Right? They can look at this and simply decide whether this is the right job for them or not. For even for the workers, is this document will help you determine should we apply or not? And for the business, it helps them to see the right people make sure that those who are happy with this position, happy with the salary, only those people are going to apply. So usually when there's a question on either person on person specification and job description, when they ask for two purposes, uh, mention one from the business's perspective and mention the other one from the applicant's perspective, that's a good way to um, approach this question. Okay, so that's the first one on HR. Done. And then question number two is from the first unit. And the first they've asked us to define what the public sector is. So part A, first point of discussion. What is public sector? These are businesses, business, businesses, uh, and owned owned and operated by the government or what we can also call the state, right? 
they are there to provide social welfare programs programs for example education Just include an example that will make this definition that much better you could have also mentioned that this is funded by access right or you could mention that they have no profit motive so any two of those points should be enough for this to my question <clears throat> then mark b says explain two reasons now once again i'll remind you that this could very well be one in your questions in your exams so be sure to read the question carefully <clears throat> So explain one or two reasons why some organizations operate in the public sector, okay? So, we have to talk about this from the business's perspective, from the organization's perspective. Now, why do they do this? The first thing is there is also, there is a, a government provide support through uh, my spelling are really bad today. Uh, G H R O U through grants or subsidies, right? And this is going to reduce the uh, unit cost of producing the unit, or this is useful for increasing this uh, revenue that you earn from the sales. Right. Second reasons why uh, organizations operate in the private sector uh, is that there is uh, they have social objectives. Right, social objectives. Just give a few examples here. It could be, let's say, um, to provide, uh, let's say, schools, hospitals, such things. Right. And that's good for uh, living standards. You could have also talked about that funding is easy. How? Because funding is easy. How is that? Because it is coming from increasing taxes. Right? You don't have to sell to make money. You're just generating taxes. You can get it from the country's annual budgets. So it's easy to, I guess, come up with money there. In a public, in a private sector, you will have to go through the whole sales process and then that's the way you bring in money. So, <clears throat> excuse me, come up with reasons why it might be useful to operate in the public sector. <clears throat> Anything you guys want to add to this, feel free to uh, do it. I'm, I may be missing a point here or there. I'm not thinking of. Uh, so don't be shy. <clears throat> All right, let's move on to the third question. And the third question will look like the first two questions in the sense that there's going to be a two mark and a three mark question. And this one is from the unit of operations. So define the term transformation process. And we know transformation process is the very essence of the operations department. What does the operations department do? They take a bunch of input and they convert it into output. So conversion of input. And you can mention it that these are the resources of the company into output, which is the product that they're selling, okay? And another point that you should always talk about when there's talk of the transformation process is that the goal is to achieve high efficiency levels. That means less input, more output. Okay, so 
Uh, you were mentioning resources here. If you wanted to mention what they are, land, labor, capital, that will also be a good way to add to your definition of transformation process. Um, if you want, you could also explain a process here that uh, transformation process could be when, let's say, a carpenter takes a bunch of, uh, let's say, wood, nails, and puts together a table. That process is also known as transformation process. Okay. okay? Uh, you could also perhaps mention one of the production processes. For example, uh, uh, flow production transforms all the resources nonstop into the final finished good. So, and an, an example use anything can make up the definition of this question. <clears throat> then this uh, topic is no longer in your AS syllabus. And the question is explain two ways process innovation could improve the efficiency of uh, business operations. So, so when this question used to be there in AS, there were two very simple concepts that you could discuss here, CAM and CAD. So CAD is computer-aided design. You will see this in your A2 syllabus now. Uh, CAM is computer-aided manufacturing. So CAD is basically this software that I'm using right now to wave my hand to you and write with all these colorful uh, pencils. That is a digital software that I'm currently using to make the product, right? So whenever you use the minutes digitized to see, for example, I prepared this paper before coming to class, right? Um, this wasn't in this form, according to CIE, it was one paper. So I've made it, made all those changes. So I made those changes and I could still make changes because it was a digital version. I could add, I could delete, I could do change color, I could do whenever I want. So CAD does that. It gives you a way to design things digitally. And computer-aided manufacturing is when you use robots, when you use machines, radars, sensors to speed up your production process. So two ways, simply computer-aided design, computer-aided manufacturing, or any other technology that you could think of that improves the production process, uh, that could be considered. For example, just-in-time inventory management system, right? Uh, that's part of operations. And just in time, for example, it helps you to reduce the level of inventory that you keep. So that also makes you efficient. Your storage costs go down. So that's also an example of process innovation. But I don't want to spend too much time on this because we don't have to worry about this until next year. So um, let's move on to the last question in section A. This would be question number four. I'm going to write number four next to it so there's no mistakes. And here they ask is how to uh, explain how a business might improve its cash flow. So the question here is about cash flow and how to improve it. And whenever there's a question on improving cash flow, there are three points that you have to think of. One, two, three. First way is to increase your inflows, right? If you can get your customers to pay earlier, if you reduce the amount of credit time that's allowed to them, uh, that's the best way to increase your cash inflow. Secondly, reduce your outflow, right? So if you can make a deal with your uh, landlord, I'll pay you three months together. That way you have to, you can reduce it. Or if you can ask your supplier for trade credit, that way you also get to reduce your cash outflow. That's one way to do it as well. But thirdly, you look for a short term source. And usually whenever you are discussing a short term source, always a good one to begin with is bank overdraft. Okay, so whenever it comes to cash flow, improving it, all the only question you could be asked in capital is how to improve it, right? So that's where you use this process. But always begin by first <clears throat> defining what cash flow is. Okay, so uh, hold on. first I would define. Remember, there's a lot of marks for knowledge in paper one, so I would define what cash flow is. Right, uh, your inflows and outflows and those things, you should also mention that it impacts the working capital of the company. <clears throat> okay, so then treat a five mark question, uh, not like a three mark question, but a shorter eight mark question, right? So 
in an eight mark question, what do we do normally? And let me just break it down here for a minute. Uh, we divide it into three parts, right? And the first part is all about introducing knowledge. The second part is then your point number one. The third part is then your point number two. So use the same process, but just fewer words. Maximum, you're looking at half a page, no longer than that. Maybe a couple of lines more, but no more than that. So five marks like this. One mark, read that for knowledge, two for point number one, two for point number two. And what's important in point number two and three is that there must be an inclusion of um, application and a bit of analysis, meaning how will the business use this or how would it impact them? There must be some angle of analysis in a five mark question. So that's the way to think when you're approaching a five mark question. <clears throat> If so, uh, my point number one uh, could be to increase my inflows and just build up your answer here. The one way to do that is to reduce the credit period allowed to customers. Okay. And the impact of that or the analysis of that is that yet you will be able to increase your net monthly cash flow. You could also talk about a negative impact that this would reduce perhaps the demand because customers like credit. So this could have a negative impact by reducing the amount of credit period to your customers. But that's one way to do it. If you can increase your inflows, that's one way to bring it more money. <clears throat> then we can, my point number two could be reducing my outflows. And here we can discuss the point of trade credit that uh, asks for trade credit from suppliers. Okay, and that way you can retain cash in business, which is good for uh, good for liquidity. Okay, and why is this good? They can meet their monthly expenses. So develop the whole point, don't leave it half good. Right? Uh, and the third point was that you could perhaps take a bank overdraft. So that's something you can mention there. That's a quick way to bring in money. You can get it for variable amounts, but the problem is that the interest rate is generally higher on a bank overdraft as compared to a longer term loan. So any two well-defined points should suffice. But look, CIE marks you for two, but they don't restrict you to two. You could write three if you want. If you feel that you write fast enough and you feel that if you can write three good points and you'll get marks for the two best, then that's how CIE approaches it. If there's three, they will give you marks for the best two. They will read the whole answer. So, so that choice I leave up to you depends on how fast you write uh, and, and you know how much knowledge you take into the exam. That will determine if you want to add a third point to it or not. But usually this process is enough. <clears throat> okay, any questions? Because this is the only tricky question in section A, <clears throat> a five marker. You could potentially lose marks here or there, but the other three are relatively straightforward. Very cool. <clears throat> Very cool. Okay. So let's move on now to section B. And we know that there's going to be two questions in section B and you don't have to answer both. You have to answer just one. <clears throat> so that means you will definitely be attempting an eight mark and a 12 mark question. 
and the difference between the two um, we should already know this by now that uh, for an eight mark you need to show knowledge application analysis only when it comes to a 12 marker knowledge application analysis as well as evaluation so that's where the 10 percent of evaluation paper one comes in in the final question of 12 marks um <clears throat> What I want to do, just give me a second here. And uh, okay. Uh, this way. Uh, is better. <clears throat> right, so let's read the question first. Um, analyze the benefits and only the benefits. There'll be no marks awarded for disadvantages. Okay, so analyze the benefits to a business of produce of, of product portfolio analysis. So let's break this down first. In terms of knowledge, they want you to talk about proper product portfolio analysis. Okay. Application could be any business, any business situation can be used here to support your answers. And then analysis is either the benefits or limitations. And here they only want us to talk about the benefits. So the sequence become, if a business uses product portfolio analysis, what are the benefits? Okay. And once again, since this is an eight mark question, we'll divide it into three parts. <clears throat> this is your knowledge. This is about 20% of your answer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then the next 40% of your answer is um, point number one. And then the other 40% is point number two. And once again, application plus analysis, application plus analysis, that doesn't change at all. <clears throat> so let's begin. And Always start with a definition in a paper one eight mark question. Okay, so um, here I have to define what product portfolio product portfolio analysis is. Okay, I'm just gonna briefly take some time to explain to you guys what product portfolio analysis is first. So. Um, <clears throat> product portfolio analysis is done on a diagram. And what a company does is that it launches multiple products at different times, right? Let's say a product is launched and it goes through its stages of introduction, growth, maturity, and then decline. And a few years later, another product is launched, then another product is launched, another product is launched. So companies will go through multiple products, product A, product B, product C, product D, right? And you're seeing this across the number of years, what is the level of your sales? That's what helps you determine whether a business, whether a product is in its introduction phase, growth, maturity, or decline. So what product portfolio analysis does is that, and show you by making a straight line first, what it does is that, <clears throat> It picks a point in any year. And I want to pick not this point, let's say this point. Okay, any point in any year, let's say this point is year four. Okay, at this point, they have all four of their products at different stages in their life, right? Two of these, as we can clearly see, uh, the ones at the part uh, products D and product C are still in their introduction phase, right? introduction. Then we can see that product B here, where it's crossing the purple line, it's in its growth stage. I need to work on my lip size, and this is in its growth phase. And this one here, product A, is going into its decline. <clears throat> so what is product portfolio analysis? In any year, a company will take a step back and look at all the different products that they've launched at the, that they've launched at different stages and they will see where each of these are 
Okay, now we can see clearly that our, um, just gonna make a note of this product A is in its decline, product B is in its growth phase, product C, production going towards growth, and product D is in its introduction phase. Right, so this is what a product for fuel analysis helps us to identify first, that what are all the products doing? And then we know that it's the growth products that are there to support your declining products, your products in introduction, and anywhere else. So if you want to identify which products are there that are making you money, and that money is then used to determine how do you fix the problems with declining products and how do you fix the problem with the introduction product. That's the first benefit of doing that. The second benefit is that, of course, first is about money. The second is you can decide which products to take forward into the future and which, which product to completely shut down, right? And so far, I think product A and product D, right? A is in its decline and D is in its introduction phase. So we don't know how where this will go in the future. We don't know where how far much further decline is going to go. So you can make a decision on which products to keep or which to let go of based on the product portfolio. <clears throat> Not only that, you can also compare your product portfolio analysis with your competitor's product portfolio analysis and see where you're lacking, where they're doing better and try to come up with strategies to match. And that way you can also gain some level of competitive advantage. So <clears throat> many uses of seeing uh, multiple products that a company launches. Remember product portfolio is simply all the products that a company is selling. So product portfolio analysis then becomes an analysis of all the products that the company is selling. And that's what we've done here. We've determined where each of these are. And then you make actions, right? You design your marketing strategy accordingly. You design your user marketing budget accordingly. And you also decide which products to continue with or which products to uh, shut down. So that's what I'm going to uh, jumble up into an answer. I hope that makes the concept a little bit clearer. That's what you will define in terms of product portfolio analysis. It allows you to assess stages of life cycle of each product. Right, And they ask about benefits. It's an eight mark question. Two will be enough, but we can mention three that way. Uh, that way uh, you are safe that you have enough points. I have a question. Will we get any case studies? Uh, will we get any case studies in paper two where we would be given a product or to analysis graph and we would have to answer on it? Um, look, it's possible, but I haven't seen uh, CIE ever use product portfolio analysis in a graph before. Usually, it's whatever I've seen has just been a descriptive uh, essay answer like the one we're seeing right now. In a paper two, um, I'm yet to see a product portfolio analysis. There's mention of it, there's a question on it, but not, uh, not a graphical representation. Okay, so let's talk about benefit number one. And benefit number one is, is that you can uh, use marketing budget efficient right and just explain that it helps you to see which one are in the growth phase and the growth phase one is going to support the products in intro and decline Okay. And that way, you're able to remain in favorable, uh, not remain, I want to use the word, maintain. Maintain favorable, and I'll explain this in a minute. Maintain favorable budget variance. 
Okay, so there's a new con chapter now, budgets, and that there's a concept called budget variance. And that helps us to identify whether you spent more than what you had planned at the start of the year. And if you're able to stay within budget, that means that you were able to save money. And whenever you're able to save money, that's called a favorable budget variance. You spent less than what you had promised. So that's good. Uh, saves you money for, so saves the company money. So, you know, just mix up the answer, explain that money can be moved from uh, the growth products to introduction one. And why is that important? Just build it up a little bit more. Um, intro products need to be promoted right uh, they struggle to generate revenue and that's where uh, revenue from growth product are used to finance promotion. <clears throat> okay. Um, so that's one benefit. No need to evaluate this point. Remember, this is an eight mark question. Then third paragraph and my second benefit would be <clears throat> you can make decisions about keeping or shutting down. <clears throat> right, and once again, just use a bit of application. It helps us to identify where each product is. It doesn't look like product where each product is on product life cycle, PLCS product life cycle. Okay. <clears throat> so you can, for example, the decline products, right? There's a decision of whether to continue or shut down. In product for product for pure analysis, samples to make decision and use its resources elsewhere. <clears throat> and yeah, so that's product for pure analysis. What else could I have talked about here? Um, yeah, I guess another point that you could have talked about, I'm just going to mention it briefly here, that uh, benefit three, it is useful for <clears throat> competitive analysis. Right, you always match it yourself up with your rivals, see where they're leading, where you're lacking, and that way you can develop your own strategy. So <clears throat> basically see where the rivals are outperforming you. And then make decisions on improving marketing strategy. So that's another user. Uh, uh, this one, so I've written here product portfolio analysis, you can make decisions and use the resource elsewhere. So when you show, when you shut down product D, of course, that the money that there was there, the workers that were there, they could be used elsewhere for other products.
All right, so that's how I would approach this question. Mm -hmm. Product portfolio analysis. Okay, so let's go to part B. And uh, if you would have picked this question, then this would be the last question that you would have to answer. And it says, discuss the importance of branding when promoting a soft drink. So <clears throat> let's figure out what the knowledge application and other parts are. So um, as soon as you see that they're talking about the concept and the concept here is branding, that part is knowledge. So what is branding where you have a clearly recognizable characteristic of a business? For example, it could be a logo, it could be a trademark, it could be a taste, uh, it could be <clears throat> your packaging anything that the customers remember you by. So for example, McDonald's, you see the big M written, you know what you're going to buy. You see <clears throat> the Coca-Cola, you know exactly the kind of product they're selling, the price range, the taste, the variety, all those things. So branding is about getting recognition for your product and instilling, instilling in the minds of the, uh, of the consumers that this is the quality of the product. And the biggest benefit and the word that you always use with branding is that branding is used to <clears throat> create differentiation between products. So for example, when you see a recognizable brand like McDonald's or Coca-Cola, you, you, you know, if I'm, if I'm thirsty, I would think of a Coca-Cola. That's the power of a brand. I, I'm just thirsty. I don't know what I want, but one of the options would surely be Coca-Cola, right? When I'm hungry, it could be one of my favorite brands. So like McDonald's or whatever that might be. So brands are about creating recall power in the mind of the consumer. If they're hungry, they should think of McDonald's. If they're thirsty, they should think of Coca-Cola. So it gives you the power to become household names. It gives you uh, global recognition that brings you increased sales, economies of scale, so many things that branding brings. It gives you, um, uh, obviously the image part cannot be forgotten about this. But the question, not, although it's asking us about branding, but it's asking us to discuss the importance of branding. And we know branding is part of marketing. It's up to marketing to conduct research and then make a product, advertise it in such a way that it creates a brand. But there's other things also that marketing starts with doing. There's other parts to the marketing mix. Uh, other than the brand, the quality is also important. Other than that, when it comes to a soft drink, um, for example, Coca-Cola's brand is big, but also Coca-Cola is associated with uh, uh, unhealthy food. McDonald's, exactly the same. So sometimes brands uh, may actually be not a good idea because, for example, uh, uh, what's that business that doesn't conduct any animal testing anymore? I think Bath and Body or something like that, right? So that's where a brand is useful, where they promoted themselves to be environmentally friendly or CSR and things like that. So a CSR can also help you to create a brand. But there's also things besides just creating a brand, you have, like I said, quality, uh, the workforce that you have, uh, the pricing level should be what the customers expect. So that's the other part of this uh, question, the evaluation part. Remember, they say discuss here. And discuss means that you will have to evaluate this question meaning explain other things that might also be important besides just creating a brand. What do they want us to talk about? They want us to talk about just a soft drink manufacturer. So that's my application. And we wanna see if it's, how important is the concept of branding for a soft drink? And we know that it's important, right? Because the competition is quite high in soft drink industry. So until and unless you have a recognizable brand, you won't be able to get the market sales that you are expecting. This is highly competitive, the soft drink industry. So branding is important. So you look at those sort of things when you're writing this answer. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's start constructing this. And the first thing I would do is I would define what a brand is. Right? And what is brand? It could be taste. It could be logo. It could be a trademark, and it could be a tagline. For example, Nike, just do it. Wherever you see just do it, you know exactly the kind of product, what they're selling, who they're selling to. That's the power of a brand. Or you just see a swish, and you know exactly what they're talking about, right? And whenever you mention brand, always mention that it is used to 
create product differentiation. Right, you basically you make your product stand out. Okay, so talk about that. And when it comes to a soft drink, it's always a good idea that in the first paragraph, just include a little bit of application. What I mean is that link the concept of branding with the type of business here, soft drink. So when we talk about soft drink, which is a competitive market. For them, uh, differentiation is important. You need to stand out to be able to uh, make the right revenue targets. Okay, so I've just I've mixed up knowledge and application within the first paragraph. That's a good way to <clears throat> start it off. And then just uh, go to the first point. Okay, and in a question like this, you know where it says discuss the importance divide your answer uh, into three parts again and the first part is once more knowledge application the next part talk about why branding is important okay and then the third part is going to be where the other things that marketing does are equally important along with branding so branding plus other factors that marketing or the entire business does right branding needs support from the operations department to meet the orders from workers to be of the right skill and quality uh, for your research to predict the kind of customer target segmentation that you that or target audience that you have so there are many things <clears throat> excuse me that a company needs uh, can a brand's name be a product's USP? Um, yeah, if it's a really funny name and it's something that really defines the brand, then sure. Uh, mm, but what would that be? Are you thinking of Apple? Well, if you're thinking of Apple, then it's not the name that's essentially uh, the, the USP. It's the kind of product that they're making, right? So maybe not so much. Can you give me an example? Musa. Give me a chance to get a sip of water. <clears throat> I'm trying to think too. Uh, hmm? Okay, let's see if we do come up with one later on. Um, anyway, so let's begin. Now let's talk about why branding might be important for a business, right? So my first half is branding is not in is important. Okay, now just use a bit of application here that for uh, soft drinks, for example, there are many varieties uh, for retail, right? When you go into a store, there are so many soft drinks that you can get your hands on. And what <clears throat> then uh, branding does, that uh, it uh, brings uh, recognition, uh, the word that I want to use is uh, visibility, right? Product differentiation means your product is easily visible for your customers. And that's what's going to increase the <coughs> potential for revenue. Okay. So um, you could also mention that it's, something that will also provide you competitive advantage. Okay, now, uh, question, customers may be more kind and different because they trust the brand and consider it to be reliable. Uh, okay, so yeah, I would agree. I would include name here as well sometimes you see the name and you're like 
that's what I want. For example, if it's a uh, Coca Cola made some milk based product, and I'll surely try it. Uh, so, yeah, sure, we can talk about that. So, uh, we were talking about how you have to, uh, like branding does all of this for a business. And the important thing in a 12 mark question is that uh, you evaluate each point as you go along. Okay, don't, there's two ways of evaluation in the question like this one at the end of each point, excuse me, and then at the end of the paper, at the end of the questions, sorry, you will have to evaluate the entire, in the entire question as well, right? So when you go for all of this, when you're creating brand, it requires extensive promotion right something will only become popular if people are seeing it enough and that's something that's going to require capital so capital requirement is going to be high and where is that going to come from and well, that's a question that you need to answer right so it is important uh, for visibility yes that's the first point to discuss here uh, so I would recommend when you divide this into two parts, two reasons for why it's important should be okay. And two reasons for why other things or two other things that might be important beyond just branding. That's also something that you can do, right? <clears throat> so um, point number two, what can I say? Um, um, yeah, you can launch other products with a strong name, right? So you can talk about that. So second application is you can increase your product portfolio, right? So uh, when that happens, you have a brand means trusted company, right? And that's where you can launch new products under the same name. And they will have a higher chance of success. And that's the power of having a brand. Um, <clears throat> you can also use this to uh, eliminate competition. Right? Uh, and then again, we also know that in terms of evaluation, they can also be uh, negative images, negative brand image associated, for example, uh, and you can use example here, uh, McDonald's, and interesting how the color was yellow when I was writing McDonald's. Uh, so McDonald's uh, is associated with unhealthy eating, unhealthy food, and, and that's not good for, uh, not good for social image of the company. Right, so brands become popular, and you know their quality stick with them. Excuse me, one minute. <laughs> oh, it's been stuck for a while. <laughs> yeah, so two reasons why branding is super super important. It gets you um, visibility. You're able to stand out from the rest of the competition. That's the competitive advantage but all the money that you need to spend on it, that's obviously going to cost you um, what else. And yeah, we talked about, you can increase your product portfolio. You, know, you can launch more products and people will at least try it once. If not becoming loyal customers, um, they will surely be ready to try it at least once. Right, so that's the first part of our answer where we're saying branding is important. Okay, now, on this side, I want to talk about why other things are important. So, um, my third paragraph, I'm just going to draw a line in the center. So, uh, we know that there's a split here. Well, that's not what I wanted to do. 
and that's better. So, um, other important factors. And what's important is obviously making the correct marketing mix. Okay, and here use the word, for example, for use the word integrated every time. What integrated means that all four of your piece, product, price, place, promotion are all saying the same message to the customer. So if it's a unique product, it'll be um, a price skimming. If it's a mass product, then it's going to be uh, maybe price penetration. So they were making sure the right marketing mix is there. It was also useful to uh, attract more customers. Not only that, you have to have a quality product. And if operations is able to do that, remember it's the job of the operations department to maintain quality, uh, then only you'll be able to maintain status of the brand. Okay. Uh, I think a big angle is that you also need to look at your uh, social and environmental impact. That's a big concern in the world these days. So this will also impact the brand image. Okay, you could talk about maybe proper segmentation Choosing the right market is also important. It's not a good idea to just keep selling product to the same market, diversifying and things like that will also be uh, part of this. So, you know, talk about this, the other important factors. This is what the evaluation of this question is. Okay, what else is important besides uh, creating a strong brand? Hmm. So I think this is what this answer should look like. <clears throat> Anything you guys want to add? No? Mm. I'm happy with this. Are you? All right, then let's move to the last question in this paper. And as you can see, we have already we just finished this one, question number five. Then there'll be another option for you to choose from. And uh, do I have a question? What was the second point? Uh, sorry, but the second point of which? Uh, this one, why it's important? Other factors? The other factor is the quality of the product. Maintaining that is also important. Only then will you be able to maintain your brand image, right? So that's the responsibility of the operations department. What I'm trying to say is that you're also dependent on other departments doing their job for the company to be able to maintain its image. <clears throat> right? And I think when it comes to this point, marketing mix, one thing that I want to emphasize more on maybe is the correct price because the correct price will set either this is a mass market product or is there some level of exclusivity with it and that's really part of the brand right what kind of a message are you trying to send and that's something that we call product positioning So determining what the right place to sell that product is, that's what it is. <clears throat> yeah, sorry, my in my hurry, I, I write operations as ops. Uh, <clears throat> All right, so let's move on to the last question. And this is it. Let me just do my fancy technique here. Uh, 
moving this question there. And this one to become invisible. There you go. Okay. So had you chosen to do the last question, this is what it would be. Analyze the advantages to a public limited company as a legal structure for a business. So this is from the first unit, business as environment, particularly chapter two, business structure. And let's break this down into knowledge application and analysis. They only want us to talk about the advantages. So that's the analysis part. Uh, the concept that's being tested here is public limited company. Uh, sorry, the concept that's being tested here is legal structure. So that's knowledge. And the application is very particular. They only want you to talk about a public limited company. Okay. So what is it saying to us? If a public limited company, if the legal structure of a business is a public limited company, what are the advantages that you get from it? Right. And this is a very, very simple question to answer. We know that. Um, okay. So let's construct the whole answer. Right. So, first of all, you will define what a public limited company is. Public company. Right. They can sell their shares on the stock exchange and they can raise large sums of capital. Uh, it is uh, um, it is uh, it has shareholders. You you have to pay dividends. It has more status. It's a kind of incorporated incorporated business. So that means registered business, uh, right? So just a brief way to define. Uh, maybe definitely you should include not maybe that there are shareholders through the exchange <clears throat> and then um my first uh, benefit of doing is that i think most important is that it has limited liability always begin with that whenever there's a question on a limit uh, on a limited company so limited liability mention just explain what that means and only invested assets at risk of uh, being lost. Right? In this way, uh, shareholders. Personal, uh, personal assets safe, which makes this an attractive investment. Uh, not only that, you can invest or divest. Divest means to sell your shares and uh, run with it. To invest or divest at any time. Right. So I'm just uh, adding as many points as I can around that concept of limited liability. <clears throat> uh, it allows also allows them to and um, say create separate legal entity, right? There you go. Entity. So no personal court cases, no personal liabilities, nothing of that sort. Um, what's another benefit of being a public limited company? It's easy to raise finance. Uh, <clears throat> uh, right, so sorry about that. Um, they are registered. On the stock exchange, and they can sell uh, ownership in company to 
the general public. And just mention then that you can issue millions of shares Right, and this is where maybe the terminology uh, of uh, issued share capital might be useful. So issued share capital is how much are you planning to raise in total from the sale of shares? So issued share capital is an important information. That is something that tells the people how much money the company is able to raise. And million of this can allow them to a large sum of capital. And this is good uh, good for speedy expansion. Remember, analysis means you have to show the impact on the business. That part must be shown towards the end of the question, <laughs> towards the end of the point, sorry. Uh, what else is the benefit? Uh, Separate legal entity, limited liability, easy to raise finance. Um, you can also get loans easily and you will also have um, proper records to take to the bank. So those are also benefits that you could mention here in this question for a public limited company. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Anything you want to add to this? Is there anything I'm missing out on? What's another benefit of being a public limited company? Uh, I guess you can hire a lot of workers, which will benefit the country in terms of lower unemployment levels. You can offer more variety of products because of the amount of resources that you have. And that's good for living standards. That's good for your own revenue. So there's other points also that you could discuss there for the advantage of a public limited company. <clears throat> okay, then let's get to the last one. Uh, and this one, again, a 12 mark question means knowledge, application, analysis, evaluation, all four elements. And this one says, discuss the view. So when it says discuss the view, that means there's always going to be an opposite view. That's how you divide your answer evaluation into two parts. Discuss the view that the activities of banks should be significantly influenced by ethics. So when I read this question, uh, break it down, they're asking me about ethics. So that's knowledge, right? They're asking you about activities of banks. That is <clears throat> application. They want me to discuss the view. Whenever it says discuss, that is evaluation. And they want to see how much influence should ethics have on the activities of the business. So the amount of influence that ethics have on the activities of business, how important is that? That's the one is, that's what they want us to figure out. And in a question like this, you know, um, and whenever, let's say, a bank is given it, it could have been any other business, sell from producer, uh, restaurant, whatever the other business is. The, the way, the, the method of applying ethics to a business remains the same, meaning that ethics means you have to be uh, responsible towards your stakeholders, right? So you make sure that your customers are not being lied to, fair prices are being charged. You make sure that your employees are being paid fairly and um, they've been given promotions. You make sure that you have ethical suppliers and you make sure that you pay you pay them on time. So those are all the things that you have to do as a business to be ethical, right? Uh, not only that, you have to take part in uh, CSR. That's also a big element of this. So all those things are what any business would have to do. And it's the same thing that a bank would have to do. The difference is that there's a, then you'll have to understand the type of business, right? So their customers are people taking loans, right? So that's what you want to do. You should give them the right amount of loans, the right interest rate should be charged. You shouldn't be misquoting things. You shouldn't be mis-selling. You shouldn't be marketing things wrongly. That's wrong for customers. When you think of employees, uh, more employment opportunities, uh, correct pay, overtime payments, 
yearly bonuses, those sort of things. So I'm going to make a brief uh, structure here, given that we are short on time. So uh, as brief as I can be. So in this, I will start by surely defining what uh, ethics are. And then the second part should be why ethics are important. And this is where whenever you're writing a question on et answer on ethics, it's a good way to just break it down into your different stakeholders. So let's say first customers. So what will customers do? They'll probably take loans. And that's where being ethical means to uh, provide uh, right amounts. Right, uh, charge correct interest rate, uh, don't miss sell, right? Uh, wrong marketing, avoid it. All of these things are how you're being responsible towards. Uh, your customers as a bank. And in return, what these customers would do for you is that they will be, become repeat customers. And for a bank, what's important is that repeat customers who are loyal, what are they going to do? They will pay on time. Right? And this is good for banks working capital. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this is uh, uh, for this is uh, the way that you are being responsible to your customers. I can evaluate this point here by saying that uh, interest rate keeps changing, right? It's up to the government to decide what to charge, what not to charge. So that's something that's beyond the control of the bank, but they still have to make sure that they are not overcharging in any way possible. And um, secondly, you can talk about your employees. That's always an easy discussion in terms of ethics. And what do we talk about? Let's say you want to give them promotions. Right, you want to give them uh, the right bonuses at the right time. Right, and this will lead to increased motivation, uh, better customer service at branches. Um, and how else will employees act to it? More, more better service, more motivation, uh, newer ideas, uh, any of those discussions could be included to this point. Um, how do you evaluate this? Well, it's going to be costly for you. And of course, giving promotions, giving bonuses, all of those things mean there's going to be extra cost for the business. And that's something that you should be mindful of when you are. Uh, practicing ethics like you should be doing, right? Um, then uh, you have to talk about other things that are also important besides being ethical, right? That's, remember, uh, in a 12-mark question, you have to have two, there's, there's two sides to the question. One, the obvious one, where they're saying, look, ethics sh should influence the activity of a bank. And, and we've discussed how that's important. Surely, we're all for it. But besides ethics, there are also other things that are important, right? Making uh, sure that... Uh, your workforce is skilled enough to make the make good returns on the investment of your customers. So your customers will deposit their money in a bank, and the banks make sure that your the returns that they make on their uh, investments are good enough. So that's also something that's important. Um, besides that, um, maybe how they take part in CSR activities should be important. How much they are providing in terms of profit to their owners, right? So at the end of the day. 
I mean, yes, ethics are going to cost you, but that cost means that it's going to reduce the returns that go to your shareholders. So what are you going to say to them? So the returns are also equally important, right? <clears throat> so uh, let me just show you how I would do that. So do that briefly here. So uh, other factors. So take some. Okay, so first thing is uh, let's say, talk about profitability. Right, that is also important for shareholders. And we know ethics can be costly. Mm -hmm. And by the way, these other factors is what evaluation is. So profitability is important. Uh, quality of service is also important. Uh, what else? Hmm. Oh, yeah, you can also talk about that uh, banks have ethical guidelines. I'll just explain this in a minute from the central bank. So every country will have the country's bank, which is called its central bank, and they will have their own rules and regulations for ethics, right? Do this for the society, do this for the employees, do this for your customers. And you already have rules to follow. So as long as you're remaining within those regulations, I think that's enough for a company to be ethical. You also have to talk about, you also have to worry about the profits that you're making. Of course, not just keep incurring cost all the time. So, yeah, that's how I would be answering this question. <clears throat> Anything that I'm missing out on? Um, no, I guess one, maybe, uh, maybe I guess it also depends on how ethical the competitive banks are, competitor banks, competitor banks are right if they're not spending on ethics why should you be spending on ethics because that way you're going to be increasing your cost and will give your rivals the advantage or you could also say how important are ethics to customers right because ethics are going to cost you going the extra mile and if that's going to increase the price, then maybe customers aren't looking for ethics as such. So that's also a couple of things that you could have discussed here. Hmm. That is the last question in this paper. And that should mark the end of this session. And I'm and for me telling you what it's all about. You can ask me a question still. So are there any questions? Anything that I can help you out with? <clears throat> mm. This, Mayan, this was the first question. Uh, 
Uh, when I made a part of our knowledge from male, we used in A2 papers as well. Um, so, uh, which done when you move to A2, uh, the concepts that are that you remember in A2 will actually build on the concepts that you learned in AF. So, yes, your understanding will be required of the knowledge, but when in your A2 exams, you're not directly tested again on AS content but you are expected to know it. They might mention things in the case studies that are coming from your AS syllabus. In fact, I've seen sometimes one or two calculations that come in paper three that are actually discussions from AS syllabus. So there's a little bit of crossover. You have to know obviously the syllabus. Without that, you can't make sense of marketing second year without knowing marketing first year well. So you need to retain knowledge for it too. Yeah, absolutely. But you're not directly tested on it in the second year. <laughs> okay, well done. So uh, if you're giving them together, uh, like I said, there's no crossover. Uh, you can use A2 knowledge in AS, you, uh, but try to avoid it. Usually there's, there's two very different kinds of papers, very different kinds of content. So keep the separation there, uh, but it's, don't be surprised to see something from AS appear in an in A2 paper. But they won't be a direct question on it. You'll be directly, there's, there's more content in A2 than in AS. There's plenty for you then to test you on. Okay, any other question? All right, then that's the end of this session. Thanks for, for being thank you for being here. Um, tomorrow is we're going to do a paper two uh, case study. So don't miss out on that. Uh, until then, thank you again. You've been a lovely audience. Take care. I'll see you next time. Bye bye.